them here. And perhaps we won't have to get so involved so thoroughly and disastrously over in the Middle East. Uh, you recently uh, proposed a bill that seems reasonable and logical and seems like it's got a bit of a sense that until we can vet some of these people a bit more properly, maybe we should not be accepting uh, some of the immigrants from certain uh, countries that have large Islamic radical uh, terrorist uh, organizations. Uh, but uh, 89 uh, senators said, no, no, no. We have to continue to allow mass immigration. We have to have open borders immigration. Anybody who wants to come here needs to come here. Now, the FBI director, uh, Comey, recently said, we cannot properly vet all the people that are entering the United States. Now, when the FBI director says that, uh, you'd have to say that your legislation seems uh, to be something proactive and practical to solve a problem. But unlike Lindsey Graham, who's a complete lout and I can't stand him, <laughs> he just says, let anybody in well, and we're fighting I mean, forever. I respond to that. I think, I think you made some good With points. Not a One, I think that the Achilles heel of people like Rubio or Graham is they want to profess to be so tough and we're going to fight them over there and we're going to you know, make the sand glow and all that stuff. But if you're going to do that, but you're going to let everybody come in with no scrutiny, then I don't think you're really strong on defense if you're not going to defend the border first. We have to realize that starting with 9-11, every terrorist act that you can point to in our country came through the legal immigration system. That doesn't mean we should never let anybody come to our country, but it doesn't mean we need to be careful about who comes to our country. The 19 hijackers that came for 9-11 all came with a visa. Two of them said they were students, but didn't enroll in school or weren't in school at the time. So should we police the student visa system to say, if you're coming from Pakistan, we have to know that you're telling us the truth and you want to school? Without question. But 15 years later, we're not doing it. The president says, well, refugees are all, that's just women and children, and you know, there's no risk at all. I live in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Two Iraqi refugees of uh, age 20s to 30s came to my town and immediately tried to buy Stinger missiles. It turns out when we actually did the vetting, after they were here buying missiles, we found that one of their fingerprints was in the database on a bomb fragment from Iraq. He was already committing terrorism in Iraq when we let him here as a refugee. Is there the possibility that people are going to use our normal visa system to come here to attack us? Absolutely. And we need to know that. There are 11 million people in our country illegally right now. 40% of them came with a visa legally and then overstayed their visa. But we don't seem to care. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. And if you apply that to the Middle East, we have 150,000 students that come from the Middle East each year. Many of them are good people. Many of them love America and it's good for them to come. However, if 40% of them are overstaying their visa and we don't know which ones are the good ones and which ones are the ones intent on attacking us, that's foolhardy just to have a wide open door. So what I've said is we need to push pause, and while we're pushing pause, develop a system for having some scrutiny. We already have a program called Global Entry. Global Entry is like the Frequent Flyer program. You do a background check, and if you're a legitimate businessman from France or Algeria or Pakistan, maybe you do get to keep covering, and it's pretty easy. But if you're a 25-year-old kid in the high-risk age group from a high-risk country, and you're not willing to go through the background check, then maybe you need to wait a while. And we actually did turn down a few of the hijackers. In 9-11, there were a couple of good immigration officers who turned down people who had a suspicion about somebody. One of the hijackers that we caught in advance, they call him the 20th hijacker, Masawi, was a French citizen. He came with no visa. And this is a big risk, and this is what we're talking about, and we're fools not to talk about it. All of Europe, they've traditionally been our friends. They come with visa waiver, no visa for 90 days. The problem is the people who attacked in France were all French citizens. Every one of them, if they're not on a watch list, could get on a plane and come to America with no scrutiny. So I'm not, you know, I have many friends from all around the world, people who were born everywhere. My, my family were immigrants at one time. I'm not against immigrants. I'm not against Muslims. But I am for saying that we have to have stricter rules on how we let people come. And if it's a little bit of a waiting period to get into global entry or to get into a frequent flyer program, I think that's the least we can do. And it does amaze me, though, that the bill I put forward, the vast majority of people, the Rubios, the Grahams, all oppose that. And I don't think, 
I don't think it's consistent for them to try to profess their big, you know, for defending the country if they're not willing to start by actually defending the border. Yes. Senator Paul, approximately 14.6 of Americans live below the poverty line. What's your reaction to that statistic, and what would you do to rectify that? 14.6 million, right? 14.6 percent. <laughs> the, the question is about what we do about poverty. You know, what do we do about those who live below the poverty line? We've had a war on poverty since the 1960s, and uh, I somewhat jokingly say, though, I think poverty's winning. You know, we've got a war against poverty, and unfortunately, poverty's winning. We're not a lot better off as far as percentages than we were in those days. Now, you could argue there's a little bit more of a safety net than there was before 1964. But if you argue, is there less poverty, there's still the same amount of poverty, and some would argue maybe even more poverty than there was. We've tried the idea of direct grants. Like, in my state, I have two areas of significant poverty. We have a poor urban area in Louisville, and I have all of the Appalachian Mountains, which are poor and mostly white and rural. We've tried. We have Appalachian Rural Development Programs given millions and millions, probably billions of dollars over 40 years, and it doesn't seem to have changed anything. What I've been arguing for is a different way of looking at poverty. Instead of having sending your money to me in Washington and then begging to get some back and then I have a million dollars and I'm going to bring it to you and I'm going to give it to you and say, I'm going to fix poverty, you create jobs in your community. Well, the problem is, is I have no idea who to give it to. So if I give it to John Smith in the Appalachian Mountains and I say, John Smith, start a restaurant, 50, 60, 70 percent of people who start restaurants fail. So if I give it to the wrong person, I didn't create any jobs. What I would rather do is, Andy has a restaurant, he's been in business how many years? That one, nine. Nine years. So he's proved that he can do it. I, I'm not making him a good businessman. People vote every day on whether he's going to succeed, and he has a payroll, and he has a bottom line, and he has to please you. You vote on whether he is successful. So what I would rather do to help poverty is to help a business in an area of poverty by lowering their taxes. Rather than me say, I'm going to start a new business, I often give it to the wrong person. So let's say instead of the million dollars coming to Washington, then I bring it back to Appalachia, what if I leave the million dollars in Appalachia? And so what I would do is I would carve out areas of high unemployment and high poverty, and I would dramatically lower their taxes to leave billions of dollars. So my plan would leave nearly a billion dollars in West Louisville over 10 years. My plan would leave $3 billion in the south side of Chicago over 10 years. But it wouldn't be me picking who I give it to. The problem is if you let politicians pick who they give it to, they tend to give it to people who are their friends and supporters and contributors. So like the Department of Energy passes out billions of dollars of loans. Uh, one of the loans was a $500 million loan to a billionaire. Why would a billionaire get a taxpayer-funded loan? Well, he was a big contributor to the president's. The guy in charge of the loans at the Department of Energy happened to have been a campaign operative, and they've been passing out loans right and left all to prominent Democrats. Now, I'm sure Republicans do the same thing, but we ought to stop that, and the way you stop it is let's don't give direct grants, let's give money back to communities in the form of much lower taxes, but money's money, and I think the money would be better spent because the money would actually be in the hands of the productive businesses that are already in that community. Yes? Yes, Senator Paul. Recently, um, a group of scholars and experts wrote a letter to the State Department of Justice, John Kerry, contending that the treatment of ISIS towards minorities, particularly Christians, constitutes um, genocide. These experts, they're experts in the Genocide Convention. <coughs> they contend that the systematic you know, assassination of leaders, uh, mass murders, um, torture, um, the enslavement of women in, in, in girls, uh, uh, mass rape, the destruction of church properties, Christian cemeteries, um, on and on, these just general abuse of minorities, particularly Christians, should be should be recognized by the State Department as genocide. And in doing so, they said this would this would create a measurable support in, from the international community. Why hasn't the State Department you know, acknowledge this, what is going on here in Syria and Iraq, 
And would you support that, that these scholars? Well, it's a good question for Hillary Clinton when she comes to town. <laughs> <laughs> I think when we look at the overall picture of Christians in the Middle East, there are some things we need to, to understand about their plight. And this goes to whether or not it's genocide or not. There have been Christians in the Middle East since the time of Christ. And there are the Chaldean Christians, were a big group in, in Iraq. They almost don't exist in Iraq anymore. Where did they go? They fled because of the war, because of the war toppling Saddam Hussein. So I would argue that the first war wasn't a good idea because it displaced, some say, about a quarter of a million Christians. Where did they go? They actually fled to Syria. Why did they go to Syria? Because Assad protected them. Now we want to topple Assad. If we topple Assad, where are the Christians going next? There's no place left. And that's the other thing about this war. The McCains, the Grahams, the Rubias, they're hell-bent on toppling Assad. They've got it. They want to beat ISIS too. They want to beat both sides of the war, which is really kind of a crazy notion. They want to bomb both sides of the war, but they want to get rid of Assad. The Christians are protected by Assad in Syria. There are more Christians in Syria than any other place in the Middle East other than Egypt. There's at least a million, some say two million Christians in Syria. If you ask a Christian in Syria, who would they rather have, Assad or ISIS? They'll tell you 100% they'll take Assad. They don't love him, but if those are the two choices, and sometimes war has a variation of evil on both sides. So if we want to help Christians, the first thing we need to do is, we need to not always think that our job is to topple secular dictators. The secular strongmen have been sort of the history of the Middle East. And I'm not saying we should advocate for the secular strongman either. We shouldn't be an advocate of giving money to Assad or to Hussein or to Gaddafi. But each time we've toppled them, it's been worse for Christians. So if we are worried about genocide of Christians in the Middle East, the first thing we should do is not do anything that makes it worse. And so I think most of the things that we've done in the last couple of decades have actually made the genocide of Christians more possible. What do you do now? It's a difficult situation now. You have millions of people displaced within Syria. I think the surrounding company, countries need to do more. Saudi Arabia won't let a Christian in their country. I mean, you can visit, but you can't go to Mecca, you can't go to Medina, and it's, you know, they're, they'll keep you in a couple little ghettos or enclaves, but they're not excited about having a, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia ought to take Christians. Saudi Arabia ought to take Muslims. Saudi Arabia ought to take some refugees. They're not taking any refugees in Saudi Arabia. Qatar's not taking any refugees. All of the Gulf states are doing nothing. Now what they have done is they've poured arms against Assad. Assad's protecting the Christians. I mean, we, we've got to tell our so-called allies like Saudi Arabia, they need to, to stop what they're doing and they need to be part of the solution. Saudi Arabia needs to quit fomenting around the world radical Islam. You know, they say during the Afghan war, they send all that money, including Saudi Arabian government money and U.S. government money, we sent on the side of bin Laden and the Arabs that were fighting in, in uh, Afghanistan. Saudi Arabia's logic was, well, we don't want them fighting the kingdom. We don't want them fighting the monarchy at home, so we're going to export our terrorists to another country. And uh, the problem is then they finally started coming home. And that's when they finally got upset with bin Laden when he came home and started fomenting terror within Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia's got to decide if they want to be part of the modern world and if they want to be part of the solution. And um, there is no easy answer as to what we do for the genocide over there. But I agree, Christians are at a great deal of risk whether you call it genocide or not. Um, yeah, they're at huge risk. If, you, if you're in an ISIS-controlled territory, it's genocide. Yes? Um, I feel like one of the worst things any state could do is commit civilian casualties. And with war, it kind of comes to be accepted that People like uh, just believe there have to be civilian casualties. Um, many, not only the United States, but also many of their NATO allies, uh, and especially Israel, um, sometimes uh, have civilian casualties that outnumber uh, the casualties of their targets. Um, what would your administration do to minimize not only civilian casualties committed by the United States, but also would you uh, consider sanctions for places like Israel that use indiscriminate ordinance on civilian population centers? I think there's the difference between, um, and it is not to justify, but I think there's a difference between inadvertent <coughs> civilian casualties and uh, purposeful civilian casualties. So if a madman from ISIS runs in here and starts cutting everyone's head off, we're non-combatants, we're not involved in a war. That is atrocious and horrific. 
if in the middle of uh, World War II you drop bombs on a military base and people around the military base are killed, um, that is inadvertent. And I'm not excusing it, but they're not the same thing and they're not morally equivalent. That being said, I'm as horrified by anybody else, the bombing of a hospital in Afghanistan recently, the uh, Doctors Without Frontiers. I wouldn't be bombing anybody in Afghanistan now. I think our mission is long over in Afghanistan. It's probably going to be uh, revert back to what it's always been, which is not really a country uh, when we leave. But I'm not for staying in Afghanistan, and I'm not for continuing the bombing. So one way we'd avoid inadvertent casualties is we'd have less war. I wouldn't be involved in war in Afghanistan. And um, I think that there is no exact, but I don't want to accept that there's a moral equivalency between ISIS chopping the heads off of civilians and people uh, losing their life you know, through bombing that, that isn't perfect. And I think we do try as a country. We're not perfect. We do try as a country to minimize uh, civilian uh, damage. And I don't blame our soldiers. I blame our policymakers for why we're dropping bombs in Afghanistan at all anymore. We have, we have no mission in Afghanistan anymore. There's not anything that I can think of that we would be bombing people for in Afghanistan. Maybe one or two more. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've studied quite a bit about uh, the Russian Federation of States, our relationship with them. On September 11th, uh, the first call to then President Bush was from Vladimir Putin telling him that he was volunteering to stand down his troops. And um, they provided all sorts of military support. They flew American armament into Afghanistan. They, most of the American special forces early on came in in American helicopters. It's interesting how no one is admitting that the Russians were perhaps our greatest ally in the early days in Afghanistan. No one is even admitting that this ever even happened. And it was so recent. It was only 14 years ago. It was unprecedented. How do we get back to having that relationship with Russia again? And maybe we should find a way to work with them in Syria and support some of what they're doing. And I really believe, by the way, in Syria, that if we really showed a, a front, Russia, the United States, France, all of Europe, I think that much of ISIS would simply disappear just out of fear because it would be so overwhelming the force that I think many of them would simply dissipate them. I guess my question to you is how do we get back to that relationship because it really did happen. I think the first thing we have to